scent of grapes and wine is always in the air. We're in Orvieto, where wine production has been part of the local landscape and economy since Etruscan times. Rigorously cared for vineyards throughout the countryside, around the hilltop town, into the distance, joining the soft, rolling hills. Wine has in fact always been an important resource and a distinctive feature for the city, as proved by a wealth of literature, art, history, archaeology and the work of artisans. The quality of Orvieto wine was appreciated and celebrated by poets, popes, artists and travellers. We should think back to the medieval poet from Orvieto, Simone Prudenzani, famous for his sonnets about vineyards, and the evocative expression Terre Vignate, a land of wines, to describe the area where vineyards are cultivated. And a few centuries later, a poet famous for his work in Roman dialect, Giochino Belli. He wrote about a sonnet, The Rules Against Drunkenness, in 1835, where he mentions the white wine of Orvieto, and considers it for important occasions, both for its excellent quality and high price. And then Sigmund Freud wrote about the wine in a postcard to his wife during a visit here in September 1897, defining it as renowned and similar to port. Even before the invention of writing, wine had a fundamental role in everyday culture and life in Orvieto, as shown by many important paintings in Etruscan tombs in the area. Pictures dating back to the second half of the 4th century BC are also found in a wide variety of Etruscan and Greek ceramics that were made to store, taste or sell wine. Frescoes on the tomb of Golini I, preserved at the National Archaeological Museum in Orvieto, depict the preparatory stages of an Etruscan banquet, where the servants are cutting the meat, positioning the food and drink correctly on the table, next to the banquet where Ade and Persephone were present. We can clearly see all the pieces of fruit here, even the bunches of grapes. Valuable Etruscan bucherie and ceramics imported from Greece that were designed to hold wine have been found in the Orvieto necropoli and many other objects that reveal just how important wine was to the Etruscans. Refined olas and amphoras that contained wine in aristocratic or ritual ceremonies. Painted stamnoi and crateres were useful just before a wine tasting to oxygenate, cut and mix the wine and oinokoi were used to carefully pour the wine into kilekes and cantharoi. These were painted or decorated cups of a cylinder shape. In ancient times, wine was also used for recreational purposes, for example in the game Kotobos, which was originally Sicilian, but also very popular in Magna Grecia and in some areas of Etruria during the banquets. The game involved flicking the dregs or drops of wine from the cup into a target placed in the middle of the room. And pride was taken not only in hitting the object, which was usually a small metal disc balanced on a lampstand, but in the sound it made when it fell, and also the correct form of the throwing motion. We know little about the organoleptic properties of ancient wine. They seem to have preferred it sweet because they would start to harvest the grapes when the grapes were wrinkled, or they sweetened the wine with honey. We have more information about wine growing in Etruria in the 7th century BC when imports of Phoenician and Greek wines were reduced and Etruscan wine was exported in greater quantities to Lazio, Campania, Eastern Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica and the Mediterranean coasts of France and southeast Spain. 
This increase of trade tells us how intense the production of ancient Etruscan wine was. And this continues into the Roman era. Many wine and forests have recently been found near Orvieto at the Paliano Riverport, confirming this. Wine production and trade continue to play an important role in the economy and the history of Orvieto even in medieval times, as the artisans working in the wine sector would meet up with the wine and grappa guilds to protect their produce and sales of their merchandise. Vines and grapes are sculpted in the bas-reliefs of the façade of the Duomo, with clear reference to religious tradition. You can see grape vines in one of the many flourishing plants growing in the Garden of Eden, and wine becomes the blood of Christ when consecrated. Wine also has an important role in the construction of the cathedral. Luca Signorelli was paid, as stated in the contract, with a great quantity of wine for his commendable work in the chapel of San Brizio. Medieval ceramics very often illustrate Orvieto's link to its wine culture too. Old or broken ceramics were usually thrown down the booty, small shafts for the rubbish, and these can still be seen today along the Via della Cava. Fragments of medieval pottery have been found here, and some Maiolica cups, jugs with trefoil rims, pitchers with pelican spouts, tableware with geometrical, vegetable, zoomorphic and imaginary patterns in the characteristic colours of brown and green on white enamel. Containers were sometimes decorated with protomy or pine cones in relief, depending on the artist. In addition to the production of ceramics on a large scale, there are also a few rare pieces, like this original cup entitled Drink If You Can, unique with its ingenious system of connecting holes, designed so that it was only possible to drink from one of the spouts if the hole on the handle was closed. The scent and flavour of Orvieto wine can still be enjoyed today in the many taverns dug into the tufa rock. Chambers that together with the wells and cisterns form an underground labyrinth in a city where the wine continues to flow and be sipped calmly, savoured and most importantly while continuing and preserving the ancient culture.